I am so excited about our keynote speaker. I, in a sense, grew up watching Jim Boyd. Not in a sense, I did grow up watching Jim Boyd. We were a Channel 5 house. Um, I told them, my mother made sure. That was her station and we watched Channel 5. Um, but uh, we, we've, we've been chasing him for a number of years now. Um, when, uh, when we first called, I think it was a few, a few years back, he said he would love to do it, um, but his daughter was in school and, and lacrosse, was she? Field hockey. Field hockey. And he made a commitment to be at all of her games. Um, so depending on that schedule, uh, he would make it. But you know something? It says an awful lot about the kind of person he is, and that was the first thing I thought. Um, my other quick Jim Boyd story is we had his partner uh, on, on television, his anchor partner, Susan Warnick here a number of years back. Not here, it was actually, as the mayor mentioned, we used to spread our, our uh, programs out. This was at the Koch Center, and um, she, she came and gave a talk, a wonderful presentation. I was really, really impressed with her presentations. After she finished, she said, I'm going to take questions and answers, but let me just say this before I do that, yes, Jim Boyd really is that nice. <laughs> so I, I, that, that, that's, that stuck in my mind. It was really a confirmation of what I think uh, many of us uh, perceive. Um, but let me, let me tell you a little bit about Jim. He's a former television news anchor and producer reporter who spent the majority of his broadcast career at WCVB-TV, Channel 5 Boston. He retired in December of 2008. Boyd started at WCVB as a general assignment reporter in 1971 and moved to New Center 5 Weekend Anchor Desk in 1976. He took over as co-anchor of Channel 5's Eye Opener and Midday Editions in 1984. His Eye Opener assignment ended in 2000, but he continued to co-anchor the top-rated New Center 5 at Midday with Susan Warnick until 2006, and then he was named special correspondent and began reporting for the bostonchannel.com and the station's evening editions. Boyd grew up in Harlem, attended New York City schools, and entered the television industry in 1961 in the mailroom at the National Educational Television, NET, in New York City. A Ford Foundation grant sent Boyd to Boston's WGBH-TV in 1967, where he picked up production skills and produced initial installments of Say Brother, now Basic Black. He returned to NET in 1968 and was appointed producer of the Emmy Award winning News and Perspective. Boyd traveled extensively, helping to produce programs in France, Japan, Germany, South Vietnam, and Egypt. Outside the newsroom, Boyd was busy, regularly visiting Boston area schools and working with community groups and charitable organizations, including the Roxbury YMCA, Boston's Youth Enrichment Services, and the Massachusetts chapter of the Huntington Disease Society of America. Jim has been a parent, volunteer, coach for the Needham Track Club, St. Joseph's Basketball, Needham Softball, and Needham Soccer Club. Boyd has served as a local board member of AFTRA, the American Federation of Television and Radio Addicts. At, I was going to say addicts. Jeez, that's not good, huh? <laughs> Radio artists. <laughs> Some of us are addicted to, uh, to the news. Uh, he was inducted to the Golden Circle of National Academy in Television Arts and Sciences, New England chapter in November of 2011 and inducted into the Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame earlier this month, September, which we were discussing was the ceremony was held here at the Marriott Quincy. Boyd is married to Linda Pollock, an executive producer for Greater Boston with Emily Rooney at WGBH TV. Boyd attended Long Island and Fairfield Dickinson Universities in Greater New York City after his retirement from WCVB-TV in 2008, he returned to college to complete his undergraduate degree starting in the spring of 2009 at UMont Mass Boston. He is now attending Tufts University in Medford, majoring in sociology and is on pace to graduate in 2013. 
and we're all invited to his graduation party. Well, we're not really invited, but we're going to go anyway. It's my pleasure to introduce Jim Boyd. And certainly you appreciate the opportunity to be here and you know, chat with you this morning. Okay, that'll work. It's never happened on Channel 5. <laughs> That's what you got when you, you have me running the... No, it's all me. It's, it's been the fact that I haven't been involved in broadcasting in such a while, such a long while, three years now in running, um, that, you know, some things that used to come naturally, you know, don't <laughs> as often anymore. Thank you all so very much for having me here to talk to you this morning. Uh, what I hope to do is let you get to know me just a little bit better. It's interesting anytime I hear of my bio read. I mean, I get to the point where I think, who is he talking about? <laughs> you know, I'm too young to have done all of those things. But recognize the fact that in a lot of ways, I'm in the same category as you all are. You know, I am a senior and a senior, a senior at Tufts University. And I guess, you know, based on the age that I've been able to accomplish, I am a, you know, considered a senior, a retiree, an elderly person. And like most of you, I am sure you don't feel elderly. You know, when I look out, you don't feel like seniors. And when I look out, I see such vitality, you know, warmth, smiles, health, enjoyment. And that's what it's all about. And I tend to think that what I've, what I've been able to hear in how you all are being serviced by the city of Quincy and the center. You're getting what you deserve. I've always maintained that no matter how successful an individual is in life, you didn't do it by yourself. You can have all the talent, be the best, the top of your game. You didn't get there by yourself. You had to have support, the support of your family, the support of people that preceded you, the people that sort of took you under their wing. And it is the assemblage here in this room today that basically gave so much to what the city of Quincy is all about. So much of the success basically can be attributed to you all. And what you did for yourselves, for your families, for your community, those are the kinds of things that I find very heartwarming. You know, just to know that people work hard, they, enjoy each other's company. You know, they work for each other, they pool together, they put their resources and their minds and their energies together to make their, you know, themselves, their families, and their communities much better places. I started at uh, WCVB back in 1971. The station at that point hadn't even gone on the air, and I arrived at what was a former Caterpillar uh, tractor parts factory. There wasn't even any concrete on the floors. The place that is now a big, vibrant, beautiful studio, you know, had a dirt floor. You know, there was an area in the back that one of my buddies and I, while we were waiting to get on the air, waiting to have responsibilities and things to do, we were playing hockey, floor hockey. Uh, <clears throat> and it's just incredible that what started as a community-minded idea to take a television station that people at Channel 5 at the time, people at Boston Broadcasters at the time felt wasn't serving the community and do more with it in terms of being a service to the community and helping to inform and educate and also entertain people. Uh, that's how Channel 5 WCVB-TV got started, with uh, a spirited, committed group of local people deciding that they wanted to put a television station on the air and do more service. And I fortunately was able to become a part of that and watch as Channel 5 put more local television programming on the air than anybody else in the country was doing at the time back in 1972 and become an enormous success. And I'm just a beneficiary of, of that. You know, as Tom mentioned, I started 
back in the mail room of a place called National Educational Television. A very young kid who kind of lost his way. I had started in college and that didn't work out very well. I got a letter one day in the mail after being in school for three years and the letter came from the Kant people, C-A-N-T. Jim, you can't come back. <laughs> Your academic performance to this point has been so poor. You've been on academic probation for just about the entire career. We don't think you're gonna make it. So why don't you find something else to do? I was heartbroken. Can you imagine? Uh, at the time, I was, I was very young. I started college at a very young age. I was 16 when I started college. I was 19 when most people would be going into college when I got the letter from the camp people. And I had no idea what I was gonna do. So I sort of wandered into a place that said, well, you know, we're an employment agency. We have a job that we think you can do. It's in a mail room. I said, well, mail room? That's like starting at the bottom. I have three years of college. Not to mention, it was three years of college that basically got mostly D's and F's and a couple of C's along the way. <laughs> but <clears throat> at any rate, that's, that's ancient history. I started in the mailroom of Channel of uh, NET in New York City and started to make my way up. And then I got to the point where I was in a studio and said, well, what's this all about? And I realized at that point that there was something that I found very attractive. This is a television studio. This is how they put television programs on the air. And I'm reminded that one of my mother's older sisters, you know, my mom was born in Virginia. She and two sisters moved to New York City back in the 1930s. And they all decided that they had to stay together because they were a strong family. And when they individually got married, they decided that we were still gonna celebrate holidays together. So my mom did the uh, Thanksgiving celebration and two aunts did Christmas and New Year's. And after I got my job in television, I was working on the production staff at NET, one of the aunts says to me, oh, Jimmy, you're working in television. Good, you can help me out. I don't know what's the matter with my rabbit ears. I can't get the reception that I need. <laughs> I said, Auntie, I'm sorry, but I'm not a technician. That's not what I do in television. I help to make the programs produce the programs that come on the air. And she said, oh. I said, well, auntie, you understand when the programs are about to end and they, the names start to appear on the screen and they just roll down the screen? She says, yeah, that's annoying because I can't see what's going on underneath it. But I, I was able to get a lot of experience there at uh, NET in New York. And they sent me to Boston for a year uh, Ford Foundation grant, as Tom mentioned, you know, so that I could learn a little bit better some of the things that were going on in terms of a television production and television in the, stu in the studio. And I learned an incredible amount when I was here in Boston, not the least of which was just how warm and receptive people in this area can be, despite the reputation that Boston had you know, back in the early 1970s. And I had a great experience at, at uh, WGBH, you know, studying under that Ford Foundation grant. And then I went back to New York. And then the world just opened up. It's sort of like the oyster that they talk about, just opening up. And so many opportunities came from that. I got an opportunity to go to Paris for the Paris Peace Talks that they were talking about during the Vietnam War. I sat in the chancellor's office in Germany, in Bonn, Germany, when there were two Germanys. I was in the presidential palace in Cairo, Egypt, when Nasser was president. I was in the presidential palace in Saigon, in South Vietnam. And all along, you know, almost the same is the reaction I have when I hear my bio read. Is this really me? Did I really do all of these things? So I say that to say that you're looking at one of the people who is the most grateful, feeling I am the most fortunate person in the world to have had all of these great opportunities. Me, this little kid from Harlem. And while I was working as an associate producer at NET in New York, and I talked about the travels, 
I tried desperately to complete my education. I knew it was the one thing that my parents valued most was education because they felt that that was the key. It was not necessarily who you know, but what you know that determines who you are and what you can do with your life. And they felt that education was a very important part of that. So again, I tried desperately after having that horrible you know, stumble at the beginning of my college education to get back into school. So I'm taking night classes at Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey and doing relatively well. But I was also doing relatively well at work. And there were opportunities for me to go to Paris or go to class. I went to Paris. <laughs> the opportunity to go to Cairo or go to class. I went to Cairo. You know, and on and on and on. You know, go to Osaka, Japan or go to class. You know, classes were one day, two days a week. The trips were two weeks at a time. And so eventually I got the point that maybe I'm gaining more valuable life experience you know, by taking these trips, producing these programs, meeting some of the world's leaders, and understanding more about the world than I could possibly do by sitting in a classroom. But in the back of my mind was always, Jim, you need to get your education. You need to get that college degree. And now, at 70 years old, I have to get my college degree. And you want to know the most important reason why? And we talked earlier about, you know, Tom mentioned, my daughter, my youngest daughter just graduated from college in May. And she has a bachelor's degree from Cornell University in American Studies. I'm gonna brag a little bit about my daughters. My middle daughter graduated from Georgetown University back in 2008. And in 2010, she got a master's degree in business slash sports management from San Diego State University. My oldest daughter, I'm still trying to keep up with her. You know, she's just incredible. Uh, bachelor's degree from Yale, master's degree from UC Berkeley, master's degree from Brown, and she's now an assistant registrar at the Montclair Art Museum in Montclair, New Jersey. So these are the people that I, the dad, am trying to keep up with, not to mention that my wife also has a master's in Boston University. So I, the only male in the house, <laughs> am the only one who doesn't have a college degree. But, as my mom would say, good Lord willing and the creek don't rise, I'll get mine in May of 2013. The education is extremely important to me, and I'm having a blast. Uh, I'm majoring in sociology over at Tufts University, starting to understand a little bit about the world that I've seen go by me, you know, come across my anchor desk, I'd read stories about things that were going on in Africa and Egypt and other places in the United States. You know, understood a little bit about what was happening back in 1968 when they were having riots all over the country for one reason or another and, you know, politics and all of those things. Um, I didn't pay as much attention to them as I should have. But now, as a student, I have an opportunity to read in depth and read some more in depth and study some more in depth. Um, and just in case any of you were wondering, as I was wondering when I you know, began my uh, re-pursuit of a college education, well, oh, Jim, you've got all this great life experience. You can go someplace and they'll just give you a degree based on your life experience. So I enrolled at the University of Massachusetts right after I retired in May of, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, December of 2008. So January 2009, so well, what about the experience? How much credit am I gonna get for that? Zero. <laughs> you know, we're bringing you into UMass Boston 
as we would any other transfer student. We'll see what you have in the way of credits that we can bring over from your previous studies. And it wasn't very much. <laughs> but you have to do what every other student does. You want a degree, you have to earn it. And so I began earning my degree. And one of the, one of the things that happened to me, which I thought was just amazing, and one of the reasons why, you know, this is really meant to be. I took two courses at UMass. One was in film study, and the other was in African American music. And one of my advisors had suggested, you know what you should do? You don't want to get stuck standing in line at the bookstore when class is open. Maybe you can go a couple of days early and get your books. And I took that advice. I went and I got the books that would be necessary for my classes. But, ha, ah, totally unlike me, I opened them and read them. <laughs> or at least started reading them. And in the music book that I had, the textbook, I ended up on page 287, and lo and behold, I find a picture of my grandfather. My grandfather was a musician, a violinist, who in 1925 appeared with the Negro String Quartet at Carnegie Hall in New York. I think that's a big thing. It's a really, really big deal. And of course, I knew that my grandfather was a musician. I knew he played violin and even had a, a copy, well not a copy, but a similar picture to the one that appeared um, in the book at, at my home that my dad had left after he passed. But I didn't have any idea what the, the scope and the depth of what he did, what he accomplished was. And I was able to contact the archivist at Carnegie Hall in New York and get a copy of the program from that day in November 1925, and also a copy of a, um, a music review that was written in the New York Times. And so that has in increased the amount of, of meaning that I have you know, from, from that event, and understand mm, something else that I now have to try to live up to. You know, but unfortunately, the musical gifts you know, just kind of skipped over my generation. You know, two brothers, no musical talent, me, no musical talent, and we, as hard as we tried, my daughters apparently don't have any musical talent either. Uh, but then I, I, I spent uh, a semester at UMass Boston and then went over to Tufts University. A good friend of mine is involved in the medical school, and dental school rather, and he suggested that, you know, Tufts might be you know, a better fit for you. And one of the reasons that Tufts is, in my estimation, a better fit is because they have a program called REAL, Resumed Education for Adult Learners, which certainly I qualify as. Uh, Chronicles did a little profile story on me and what I'd done after my retirement uh, about a year and a half ago. And in it, it mentioned that I am the oldest undergraduate student at Tufts University. And I thought maybe if I were a faculty member, they would say the same thing because most of the people that are teaching me are far younger than I am. But it's just a terrific thing for me to be in that environment. Uh, it's a learning environment, it's a nurturing environment. And from the vantage point of someone who sits at a news desk, what we had, what we had come across our desk all the time were all of these negative things about young people you know, the auto accidents and the pregnancy packs and the drug use and the drive-by shootings and all of those negative things that we see about young people and not nearly enough about the positive things. One of the nice things about being on a campus like Tufts University or, you know, UMass Boston is that here you're surrounded by some of the best and brightest, most altruistic young people that you can find anywhere. And I think that what they are simply is a reflection of your generation and my generation. You know, the people that are caring and altruistic and bright and thinking and want to do best, the best they can for themselves and for others. And it's just nice to be in that environment because I draw a lot of energy from the kids that I'm with. And I have to make this confession. I am in awe 
of the students that I sit in classes with, I am intimidated by them. How can they be 18, 19 years old and know so much? Be so articulate? Be able to process information and you know, not regurgitate it, but process information and, and discuss it and explain it. You know, if it weren't for the students that I'm in class with, I don't know what I would do. You know, when it's, well, what does this mean? And then I have some, you know, 20 something say, well, Mr. Boyd, this is what it means. And it's extraordinarily helpful to be in that environment. I have talked a little bit about my family, talked a little bit about myself, hopefully talked a little bit about you in a very positive and admiring way. And, you know, <clears throat> when I was at the ceremony for the Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame and getting that award, I was in the presence of Massachusetts Broadcasting greatness and legends. <laughs> it was incredible. Just the number of people who, you know, those names that you would recognize, those voices you've heard on the radio, faces you've seen on television here, just to be considered in a group like that. Uh, I'm humbled by it, as I am humbled by the fact that I'm invited here to talk to you. But I mentioned the Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame because what they did is they gave us a time limit and said, okay, you may speak for three minutes, five minutes. And at the end of the three minutes or the five minutes, music was sought to play as a signal that, okay, you've gone on too long. And the one thing that I tried desperately to avoid was hearing the music. And I get a sense that right now, it's time for me to say thank you all so very, very much <laughs> for allowing me the opportunity to be here and to speak with you and share a little bit of my thoughts and a little bit about my background. Because I have a funny feeling if I go another 30 seconds, I'm gonna to start to hear the music. Thank you all so very much.